Hello? Oh. I think you just talked about I think it's possible that you, sorry. I think it's possible you need to like press some button. Yeah, this Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, shall we just start? Okay, so um, welcome everybody to one of the three uh, panel sessions in parallel. So first of all, of course, we, we realized the choice was very difficult to make and we're all very grateful for the choice you made. So um, let me start by introducing the panelists and uh, explaining the format, and then I think we can just get going. So we, we have four panelists today. We have um, Alex Bellin, we have Olga Papadoulaki, we have Alex Maloney, and Lorenz Eberhardt. And so each of the four panelists will basically start by giving a short presentation of about 10 minutes. And um, well, of course, the overall idea is that this should be interactive and include also very much the audience. However, at first, um, we're going to restrict to uh, questions immediately following the short presentation of each panelist that we keep short just a few minutes, but everyone is invited to ask questions. But I will, you know, if it, if it gets too much, I will cut it off and we will leave it for the open discussion that will follow um, all of the panelists. Um, so, um, yes, it, regarding the questions, this session is being recorded. I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. Um, no, I mean, you know, it's better to know. And um, I wanted to just make one more sort of uh, public service announcement that we all decided that the presentations will not include referencing simply for the shortness of time. Of course, uh, we apologize for everybody who has not been mentioned, but we have done it in a dem democratic fashion. We are mentioning nobody. This is, of course, no claim of originality. It's just a choice because of shortness of time. So with that, um, the order will be that Alex will go first and then we'll go along this nice United Nations panel of, of panelists. So Alex, please take it away. Great. Well, let me start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity um, to speak here today and congratulate all of you on making the right choice. Um, so the questions that we're going to try to address in this discussion today are, are the following. How do we handle Euclidean or space-time wormhole contributions in the gravitational path integral? And what is the role of ensemble averaging in holography? And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, a Euclidean wormhole is a geometry that stretches between two or more asymptotically ADS regions. Now, already since the early days of ADS-CFT, these geometries have been very confusing. Because if you try to compute the square of a partition function or the product of two partition functions using gravity, well, you fix the boundary conditions for the gravitational path integral, here are two circles, and then you sum over all smooth geometries that fill them up. And you're gonna get disconnected contributions as well as connected wormhole contributions. And if you sum up the two, what you're going to get is not a product of a function of, say, the left boundary conditions and the right boundary conditions. But of course, in quantum mechanics, the partition function is a number. So if you take the product of two partition functions, you're supposed to get the product of the two numbers, and you seem to get a mismatch. Okay, This is what's known as the factorization puzzle. And I think the old point of view was, well, because of this, we should not really include wormhole geometries in the gravitational path integral. Either because they're unstable, they could be perturbatively or non-perturbatively unstable due to brain nucleation, or perhaps they're not in the contour of integration of the gravitational path integral, or perhaps there's some other reasons. Now, of course, through the last couple of years, there's been really exciting progress on the black hole information paradox. And I think it's fair to say that wormholes have really been the star player in this program. Um, and as all of you know, I'm sure, if you try to compute certain observables like two-point functions or entropies of Hawking radiation and use only the black hole saddle, you quickly run into tension with unitarity or discreteness of the CFT spectrum. And what we've realized is if you include wormholes in the gravitational path integral, this helps, okay? Maybe don't, you don't resolve all problems, but you really go a long way. So I think the new point of view is we want to keep the wormholes. They're teaching us something very important, something very deep. Uh, but of course, we must revisit the factorization puzzle. So one possibility is that gravity is an average over theories. 
if you have some Hamiltonian parameterized by some couplings j, uh, when you compute the partition function, you can compute the partition function for each j and then take the, the integral with some probability distribution over the couplings. Um, and then if you have such an ensemble average, it's no longer a surprise that the product of two partition function doesn't factorize. Okay, and in some low dimensional models of gravity, most famously 2D JT gravity, this is what happens. It's dual to an ensemble of Hamiltonians. But what I want to emphasize is that uh, this is no longer quantum mechanics, okay? So this is a pretty violent deviation of what we thought the rules of the games were. Another possibility is that factorization is restored by uh, including other ingredients coming from the UV. So to get a factorized product of partition functions, you sum up the geometries that you had before and you include UV ingredients. They could be strings, brains, non-local interactions, half wormholes, or what have you not. And that everything together gives you a factorized answer. Okay, so these first few slides were just to sort of set the stage of the types of things we're going to discuss today. And in the time that I have left, I just wanted to bring up some questions that I find confusing and that hopefully can lead to some discussion. So the first set of questions are related to averaging. I think it's pretty clear that if you take a, your favorite top-down uh, theory, for example, you know, n equals to four super young mills at fixed n and fixed lambda, well, explicitly, there's no ensemble averaging. But of course, the bulk dual to that is full-blown string theory, maybe even string field theory. I think the question somehow that we're really trying to circle around is what is the CFT dual of semi-classical GR? We're used to semi-classical GR as an EFT, but somehow it's a very smart EFT that knows a lot. And what is its CFT dual? Is that an ensemble average? And if so, an ensemble average over what? One thing that I think is important is that we would like the answer to this question to be universal. It shouldn't depend too much on which of the top-down theories you picked. And in, in many of the top-down theories, you just have an isolated CFT point. There's nothing to average over. There's no conformal manifold, for example. The only parameter you have left is n, the central charge. Uh, that's always there. It exists for any top-down theory. So should we average over n? Uh, alternatively, we could give up on conformal invariance and try to average over non-CFTs. And if you think about a four-point function of four operators, four heavy operators that create black hole microstates, this is not something that we think we can compute in semi-classical GR. So maybe we should relax the crossing constraints on these types of correlation functions, and that'll free up some parameters that we can imagine integrating over. Is that the right thing to do? A viewpoint that I actually like better ties wormholes to quantum chaos. I think we're gathering more and more evidence that what worm, worm, wormholes really do is that they geometrize statistical correlations of the microscopics. And in the CFT, the microscopics is the list of operator dimensions and OPE coefficients. From this point of view, how do you think about the bekenstein hawking formula for black hole entropy? It's just giving you uh, the statistical one-point function of the density of states, how many states there are in a given energy band. And what wormholes do is that they give you access to the higher point functions or to the higher moments of this distribution understood in a statistical sense. Okay, this is not an averaging. This is a statistical, um, this is a st statistical correlation function. Sorry. Oops, what happened? No, I went back too much. Um, okay, so, so, so this is really giving you access to statistical or coarse grain, maybe we want to call it, information of the true microscopics. So do we get gravity from coarse graining? And if so, what is the right coarse graining procedure? Um, ultimately, statistical correlations should be described by the framework of quantum chaos, right? Quantum chaos is the, what tells you the, the statistics of the spectrum and the, st the statistics of operator matrix elements. And there's one question that we're maybe taking for granted but is worth revisiting is what is quantum chaos in CFTs? Is it just what it is in quantum mechanics, random matrix universality that we get from random matrix theory? Or do we need to adapt it to take into account the bootstrap constraints? One reason why this is not a completely trivial question is that all CFTs, even if we think they're chaotic, at large spin, they become free. Okay, so there's maybe some subtleties that could be important. Some final questions are related to universality in the range of chaos. I, I think it's fair to say that quantum chaos is the strongest universality we ever encountered in physics. We think there's a finite number of symmetry classes and all chaotic Hamiltonians need to lie in one of these symmetry classes. So it's extremely universal, much more even than the RG. On the other hand, wormholes are not universal at all. You know, sometimes for the problem you want to solve, you have a saddle geometry, sometimes you don't. Sometimes the saddle geometry is stable, sometimes it's not, it could be perturbatively or non-perturbatively. So there's a lot of wiggle room here, and it's supposed to describe something extremely universal. Why? Uh, and another question is related to late times. Really, quantum chaos is the theory of late times. It's about statistical correlations for very nearby energy levels in the spectrum. But the wormholes I'm talking about, I call them Euclidean wormholes, so they exist at, at early times, even at zero Lorentzian time. 
So is it possible that while quantum chaos is very universal, the range of validity of quantum chaos is not universal at all? And is it possible that holographic CFTs are out of all the chaotic systems, the one that have the longest possible regime of validity of quantum chaos? Okay, that's all I have, and I left the questions here for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, are there any uh, immediate questions or need for clarification? Um, should we should we do microphones actually? Yeah. 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 Yes, but for the recording. Oh, I can repeat the question. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's another good idea. Yeah. Okay, just a very quick question. I, oh, is it oh, okay. Just a very quick question. Uh, I think when you said with the four-point function might not obey crossing, that that would have meant the theory is non-local rather than that you gave up conformality, right? I mean, couldn't, couldn't it, it could still have the conformal symmetry, but not obey crossing. It would just look non-local. Yeah, it would, it would, it would fail. It would be yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we wouldn't know that non-local. I think so. Maybe, maybe it's a good idea to, to move on. And actually, what we decided was the best is if you take this, I use that. Okay, is this working? Yes. Um, so I would like to thank the organizers for the very nice workshop and for including me in this discussion. I don't want to repeat uh, the nice introduction that uh, Alex gave, but I want us to make some points that uh, will be important for the discussion that I would like to initiate. Uh, so we're interested in Euclidean uh, wormholes, so there is no time, we only have space direction, and we are interested in asymptotically ADS solutions, so these two regions are asymptotically ADS, and we need a throat that will connect the two regions. To support such a throat, one needs to provide for local negative Euclidean energy, and this can be done by including uh, appropriate matter such as action fields or magnetic fluxes. I would also like to make some holographic comments. So since there is no time, we don't have the usual notion of entanglement as uh, in uh, einstein rosen bridge where we have uh, entanglement between the energy levels of the two CFTs. Uh, and naively, because we have uh, different QFTs that live at different asymptotic uh, boundaries, we would expect uh, that uh, these QFTs are completely dependent and there are no cross correlations. But there is a common bulk uh, that uh, connects them and there might be some form of interaction coming uh, from that. For example, we know that um, uh, from the holographic dictionary that uh, global symmetries uh, on the boundary correspond to gate symmetries in the bulk. Uh, and uh, the global symmetries are associated with some conserved currents. We would have expected uh, this to be independent, but since they, have, they are coming from a common uh, gauge symmetry in the bulk, there is a common Gauss law constraint that uh, they should satisfy, and these currents, in the end, they are not completely independent. Additionally, I would like to make a comment about analytic continuation of such solutions. At least in the examples that uh, me and my collaborators have studied, uh, the, the analytic continuation of uh, Euclidean wormholes do not correspond to black holes, but instead, if you would choose to analytically continue along the radial direction, we get uh, a bank uh, cosmologies, and if we choose to analytically continue along one of the transverse directions, one can get traversable uh, geometries, but then one should be careful because uh, such uh, analytically continuous saddles might develop pathologies because it's much harder to provide negative null energy uh, than negative Euclidean energy. So with my collaborators, we uh, studied the various observables on, uh, on uh, wormhole backgrounds, trying to find if there are some universal properties that um, the holographic dual should have. And indeed, we found that uh, uh, the cross correlators don't, do not factorize and they have some properties. We have cross interactions that are softer at short distances. They don't have short distance singularities and they increase and become strong in the IR. 
This behavior is not possible uh, to acquire by adding a local interaction term such as a double trace deformation as was the, as was the case for traversable worm or salagouts affairs in wall. Uh, additionally, we also studied uh, Wilson loop loop correlators that exhibit uh, such a phase transition. Uh, a system uh, that uh, can have uh, the, um, the universal properties I just described is the following, a tripartite sandwich construction, where we have two uh, B uh, boundary QFTs living in a manifold sigma, uh, that they are holographic and they are coupled uh, via, via, via a semi-topological semi Diprasoan dimensional messenger theory on an interval cross sigma. The idea is that the dual bar gravity can localize on D plus one dimensional end of the world brain that bend and connect in the IR. The Zwinger functional for such a system acquires this form, where the Zwinger functional of the combined system comes from the product of the Zwinger functional of its boundary quantum field theory, uh, weighted by an appropriate function, and, uh, correlated, and they have correlated sectors uh, that we sum over. Uh, this Winger functional comes from a unitary theory, so this construction is unitary, but is also in agreement uh, with a form of averaging. It says that, for example, cross correlators can come by averaging one point functions of the individual uh, theories with appropriate uh, weighting functions. So the Hilbert space of such theory, uh, in analogy to the Lorentzian wormholes where we have, uh, so for example, in the internal black hole, the dual states is the thermophile double, that we have a correlation between the energies of the two subsystems. Uh, our proposal for the Euclidean wormholes is that we have correlation between the UN representations R of the two uh, uh, BQFTs. And this can be realized uh, with, uh, various, uh, in various uh, system and ways. Uh, in relation to the example I described with, uh, through the topo where we have the connection through the topological, topological messenger quantum field theory, uh, this theory uh, provides a gauge constraints that uh, does not allow the, the Hilbert space of the two boundary KFTs to factorize, but uh, it reduces to this, and the appropriate states can be written, state can be written in this form. Another possibility could come by having two copies of n equals four and adding heavy operators like uh, Wilson loops that pack react in the geometry, and this correlates the representation of these uh, two uh, Wilson loops. And uh, there could be also a third uh, realization uh, that I don't know if this is possible, but it would be interesting if, if it exists, to have a dynamical uh, method that um, uh, can uh, induce an, uh, an effective constraint of the Hilbert space in the IR and having a, cr a form of cross confinement. Uh, what I described up to now was uh, for uh, Euclidean wormhole saddles, but we can also have uh, uh, wormholes, microscopic wormholes that are not saddles and they form a, a gas. And these are related to alpha parameters. In this case, the characteristic length of the wormholes is much smaller than the length of ADS. And it's proposed by various uh, people that there exists a baby universe Hilbert space that is spanned by a complete set of states called the alpha states, and they are related to these uh, alpha parameters uh, that they are unfixed. Uh, but we know that in the canonical formulation of gauge gravity duality, all the bulk and boundary parameters are, are fixed. Thus, there seems to be no reason for averaging over alpha parameters. Additionally, these models treat both microscopic and macroscopic boundaries on the same footing. Uh, so perhaps uh, a more appropriate operator state correspondence could be inspired by Uville quantum gravity, where we know that exist both microscopic and macroscopic bulk states. The microscopic uh, bulk states are associated to macroscopic loop operators, and they are functionless of sources, and this creates the, EDS, uh, the large EDS conformal boundaries. But uh, we can also have microscopic operators that they create microscopic holes uh, in the geometry and correspond to microscopic states. And the similar discrepancy has been also observed in mini superspace models in higher dimensions. So I will uh, finish with some questions. Regarding the wormhole saddles, it would be interesting to have uh, supersymmetric uh, constructions that uh, they will be controllable and we will have uh, a control not only fr from the QFT tripartite system, but also uh, on the geometry, as well as to understand better what are the possible analytic continuations, both of the geometries and their holographic duals, because this way we might uh, find a microscopic model for cosmologies as well as traversable wormholes. 
Uh, regarding microscopic wormholes, a proposal would be to replace these alpha states by representation states that they are fixed. Uh, and it would be interesting to see if such proposal uh, can exist also in the case that we have asymptotically flat or the sitter uh, spaces. As well as uh, for everything, it's very important to understand worm wormholes in string theory. Thank you. As before, we have uh, just a couple of minutes for questions or clarifications for Olga. Which button should I have pressed? Yeah, uh, how about this? No, no, I don't think yeah. it's off. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> are there, so are there any questions or uh, um, need for clarification for Olga at this point? I wanted to ask you more about this tripartite model, but maybe that will take you too long, so maybe we'll postpone it until. Okay. Okay, so let's then let's move on. Thanks again. So yeah, if people want to sit down, there are actually empty spaces here on the on your right, and, yeah, and also you could sit yes, you could sit here and. Come close and to even us. There, yeah, there's plenty of spaces actually. Good. Yeah, so now we'll move on to the next Alex. Great. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be uh, Alex number two in this session. Uh, so uh, this is on? Yeah. So I first just wanted to uh, thank the organizers for putting together such a great conference and for giving me the opportunity. Uh, to participate in this very interesting discussion. I'll begin uh, just by reiterating some things that I think we already heard earlier, which is that uh, an exact UV complete theory of quantum gravity uh, is not described by an ensemble. Instead, I think my perspective is that ensembles arise only when we approximate some sort of fancy UV complete theory by a relatively simple gravitational path integral. But the point is that in a chaotic theory, uh, that is to say, in a theory which is self-averaging, uh, this replacement of a uh, individual element by an ensemble is essentially harmless, in the sense that each member of the ensemble represents the whole, up to some exponentially small corrections that have to do with the very microscopic physics of the theory. And this uh, exponentially small stuff is removed by averaging. In order to make these ideas precise, however, what we really need is to develop a theory of exactly what we mean by a random conformal field theory. So a conformal field theory is specified by some data. In particular, it's specified by a spectrum along with a list of OPE coefficients. So in principle, if we wanted to develop a theory of random CFT, we would first need to determine the allowed values of this data by solving the conformal bootstrap problem. And only after doing that could we fix some probability distribution and start computing averages. Of course, that's a very hard procedure to carry out. So I really see uh, two alternatives. One alternative would be to add symmetry to this problem until we can solve it. So for example, one of my favorite examples would be to consider 2D CFTs with this current algebra, in which case there's a finite dimensional space of solutions to the bootstrap problem. We can average over that space and obtain something that looks more or less like a theory of gravity that's exactly solvable in the sense that we could enumerate all of the saddle points and compute all of the perturbative corrections around that saddle point. That that's, however, somewhat unsatisfying because this is an integrable family of conformal field theories, and we would really rather study chaotic conformal field theories. But in order to do so, we'll need to make some approximation. So in particular, what I'd like to do is consider an ensemble of almost conformal field theories. So remember that the data that defines a CFT is a density of states and a set of OPE coefficients. So what I would like to do is consider the ensemble of CFT data described here, where we have a spectrum 
that includes an identity operator, as well as a Cardi density of states, and possibly some additional particle states with masses that are below the black hole threshold. And I'll also take my OPE coefficients to be random variables that live in a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and whose variance is given by this universal three-point function that describes the three-point couplings of heavy operators. I won't write down the explicit formula for this three-point function, but it's very similar to the DOZZ formula in Louvo theory. And it's essentially the universal formula for heavy operator OPE coefficients. That's the three-point function analog of the Cardi formula. And the point is that this, is, this ensemble does not describe an exact solution of crossing symmetry, but it's almost a solution of crossing symmetry up to corrections that are exponentially small. And I really think about it as a maximum entropy probability distribution on the space of conformal field theories, essentially a Gibbs distribution where we're imposing the constraints of some but not all of the crossing symmetries. So what is the dual of this ensemble? I claim the dual is classical Einstein gravity in ADS3. In particular, we could imagine computing expectation values in this ensemble. So here, for example, I'm imagining computing the expectation value of a genus two partition function. A genus two partition function is a sum of squares of OPE coefficients. So we can compute their averages using that Gaussian distribution I showed you. And what do you get? You get the exponential of the Einstein action of a three manifold that fills in that genus two surface. Similarly, we could compute the expectation value of the square of a genus two partition function. Now we're computing the average of some OPE coefficients to the fourth power. And when we compute that average using a Gaussian distribution, there are several different Wick contractions we can make among those OPE coefficients. Some of the Wick contractions give us the factorized answer, the union of two just disjoint surfaces. And other contractions give us this wormhole geometry that interpolates between the two sides. And in both cases, we get exactly the corresponding Einstein action of those solutions. And this works for many different examples, including, for example, defects, as well as higher topologies and wormholes with moduli that are different on the two sides. One very interesting thing about this ensemble is that it realizes the proposed mechanism of Coleman and getting Strominger. I apologize. I realize we weren't supposed to include citations, but OK, uh, accident. Um, this realizes the mechanism of Coleman et al, who proposed that integrating out wormholes should lead to some sort of uh, random couplings in the low energy effective theory. So for example, we could imagine computing a four point function of some operators O1, O2. We could compute that as a sum over geometries. It would include this sort of trivial contribution. But for every other particle state in the theory that I've called three here, there's going to be a wormhole. So look at that wormhole for a second. You can see that the particles never interact in the wormhole. The only point of this extra operator is to provide enough energy so that it can support a stable wormhole solution. So this is a solution of the classical equations of motion. One can compute its action, and it turns out that what you get is identical to what you would get if the particles one, two, and three interacted. And we summed over all of the Witten diagrams, the four-point interactions in the S-channel for this particle propagating along with random values of the OPE coefficient, C123, given by that Gaussian ensemble I described for you earlier. And so here, that wormhole has been replaced by this dashed line that represents the disorder average. So I'd just like to conclude this discussion by returning to what I think is maybe the ultimate question uh, in this subject, which is where does this ensemble averaging really come from? And the answer that I would propose is the following. So let's consider a single uh, UV complete theory of gravity in higher dimensions, which contains black holes. 
And let's imagine taking a collection of microstates of some extremal black hole and coarse graining over them to get some sort of emergent near horizon ADS cross something region. That near horizon dynamics will be described by some lower dimensional theory of ADS gravity. And the conjecture that I would make is that the process of going to the near horizon limit and taking the dimensional reduction turns the coarse graining over black hole microstates in higher dimensions into an ensemble average over many theories in that lower dimensional theory of gravity. And I think it would be great to discuss this further, but I'll just stop here and maybe flash a list of potential questions that we could talk during the discussion uh, portion uh, of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So again, I might invite people to, there, there is a question up there. You, you wrote a pretty simple Gaussian ensemble that reproduced a lot of gravitational results. Yes. But if you go to higher orders, there will be discrepancies. Do you think it's possible to sort of order by order correct your ensemble to reproduce gravity order by order? I, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So what I haven't done, I mean, a related point is what I haven't done is impose all of the constraints of crossing symmetry because I don't know how to solve the conformal bootstrap problem. Uh, I think it probably, it may well be possible to proceed order by order. Uh, so for example, Alex, uh, and sorry, no citations, the, the gentleman representing Switzerland, uh, the gentleman representing Switzerland and his collaborators uh, wrote down some contributions to the four point functions, uh, which one could then throw into the mix here. And then you wouldn't get a Gaussian ensemble, but you, would, you might imagine an ensemble where you fix the one, two, three, and four point functions of the OPE coefficients and so forth. Um, I would have to think carefully about whether that is a consistent approximation scheme uh, to include only a finite number of, of, OP, of, of moments of OPE coefficients. Um, but I suspect the answer might be yes. But maybe well, you know the answer. It would be very attractive if it is yes, of course. Yeah. But if it is, there's a follow-up question. In, order by, in higher and higher orders, we've got a more and more complicated uh, ensemble. Mm -hmm. and. It's not clear that the, the question would be whether that ensemble is supposed to have an independent description apart from the fact that it reproduces gravity. So in, for JT gravity, Saad, Schenker, and Sanford had an independent description of the ensemble. But here, gravity might be the only description. I don't know. That's just a yeah. question. Yeah. No, I think that's a reasonable possibility. Um, thank you. OK. Uh, thank you. Um, anybody else for now? Otherwise, I think, um, yeah, may, maybe one quick one now. Yeah. This is uh, just a suggestion for a potential topic of discussion. So as you mentioned correctly, uh, self-average theories are innocuous enough, but if we consider theories uh, or random theories that are not self-averaging, for example, SYK at late times, mm -hmm. uh, what uh, that entails for gravity? I yeah. uh, would like to, uh, a discussion on that question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree completely. Thanks. I mean, certainly like averaging over spaces of integral theories or averaging over spaces of uh, n not chaotic theories is a very interesting thing to discuss, where essentially you're adding in the chaos by hand, if you like, rather than um, having it be an intrinsic part of the theory. Um, I think, as I maybe alluded to in the very beginning, um, if you do that, you know, then I don't think it's fair to think of each element of the ensemble as standing in for the whole, whereas the point of a self-averaging theory is that the averaging procedure is essentially harmless, um, mostly. OK, I think uh, let's move on to the last panelist. Let me start by thanking the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to be a panelist in this wonderful discussion. And I'd like to stay true a little bit to the, uh, to the title of this conference and discuss the factorization problem more from a top-down perspective using string theory. And uh, I think this part of uh, the talk is not controversial, but I've been uh, trying to be as provocative as possible in the later parts of the talk. Um, so. 
I think we all believe that the sort of top-down constructions of ADS CFT, such as ADS5 times S5, ultimately factorize if we have a full understanding of the bulk string theory. So there are some known hints uh, in this direction. Um, so first of all, I think the original derivation of ADS CFT in terms of uh, brain construction certainly uh, suggests that we have only single CFT and not an ensemble of CFTs. In some cases, like ADS7 times uh, S4, where we have a 6D n to 2 comma 0 theory, there is also really nothing we could potentially even average over. Uh, maybe n, we could discuss that. That is the only parameter that we have. Uh, so, but if we fix n, then there is only unique theory, and so there should be no factorization problem in the end. There has been also some work uh, on the supersymmetric index, and uh, it, was claim, uh, it was shown in some particular settings that the supersymmetric index in supergravity always factorizes. Uh, so that also suggests that uh, if you go to string theory, uh, um, that you should have factorization. And lastly, there was one example uh, of ADS3 times S3 times T4 that was uh, recently understood in detail and where you could directly argue from the worksheet uh, that you indeed get a factorizing uh, answer. All right, um, so it's rather hard, I think, to, uh, to, to get more data points on this list because um, understanding, understanding uh, the factorization problem in string theory essentially requires you to understand string theory non-perturbatively in the bulk. So let me just remind you that there are uh, two types of, or maybe even more types of non-perturbative contributions in string theory. So we have the uh, better understood ones that go like e to the minus one over g string or e to the minus one over g uh, root of g Newton to the path integral. These come because of d brains and d instanton corrections to the partition functions. And uh, there has been lots of free recent progress on those. And they are more or less understood, I would say, but still uh, not quite. And then it gets much, much worse if we look at the corrections of order e to the minus one over g string squared, which is mostly what we're interested in in the factorization problem, since uh, this is like uh, the action of uh, some different bulk topologies. And uh, these corrections are essentially not understood in string theory, I would say. And uh, lastly, it's also difficult because all the non-factorizing contributions, because the index factorizes, are essentially all non-BPS. So you really have to go uh, and get your hands dirty and uh, do some real computation. And you cannot go get away by computing some indices. OK, um, for some reason, this slide is in the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know why this happened. Um, but is there a way to like rotate it on the fly? If you could do that. <laughs> if not, it's okay. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> and the next one seems awesome. Okay. Well. <laughs> Uh, well, factorization seems to typically necessitate the inclusion of uh, some uh, other degrees of freedom that are not present in pure gravity, uh, such as stringy degrees of freedom. Although, uh, the, and um, there are though some known constructions by now in sort of uh, from the bottom up where you can include some ad hoc new um, contributions like the half warm holes or uh, some other brains where, uh, to achieve factorization. So I think all of those are mostly non-local. So if you want uh, to have factorization from that point of view, you always need to introduce some non-locality. And also uh, the typical heavy string state that we have in string theory that we need to, in principle, include in our uh, partition functions is uh, likely to be non-geometric. So um, I just remind you about what the fastball proposal says, which I think is morally right. Um, so there are only certain coherent states in the Hilbert space that can be described in terms of classical gravity, perhaps with some, uh, some perturbative string excitations around that. Um, but if you look at the generic state, then certainly we can't expect something like that to be true. And uh, yeah, so that's the fastball proposal, and that's also what Emil was talking about uh, yesterday. Right? So uh, in string theory, there does not seem to be a well-defined uh, way to compute non-perturbatively the partition function of a given topology. So uh, once we fix the topology and we try to compute the partition function, uh, then 
we know that we have something like topology changing processes in string theory, and so there doesn't seem to be a way to fix the topology and compute that contribution to the partition function. Only the full partition function is well-defined. Yeah, as I said, there are these topology changing processes, and because of that, I think we should also not think of the different topologies as being sort of super selection sectors and trying to compute those different contributions separately. Finally, I want to uh, remind you of one issue that we have uh, uh, sort of notoriously in string perturbation theory. We only know really how to compute anything string perturbation theory on on-shell backgrounds, backgrounds that satisfy the supergravity equation of motion, because uh, consistency of the world sheet CFT exactly imposes that consistency, uh, these background equations of motion. So contrary to what we do in JT gravity, for example, where we can compute the partition function, including many off-shell backgrounds, uh, in string theory, at least technically, we have no idea of doing that. Um, all right, so this is my final slide then. <laughs> so uh, here are just some provocative questions that I hope we can maybe uh, discuss. And uh, so I, I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe it's a little bit misguided to uh, hope to have some uh, low energy, um, pure gravity uh, factorizing examples of holography. And maybe we should just give up on it, and maybe we should just look at the full string theory examples that do seem to factorize, and maybe understand better there why they do factorize. So maybe it's also a hint that theories of pure gravity are maybe ultimately inconsistent as uh, theories of quantum gravity, because we seem to be unable to come up with exact ADS-CFT dual pairs, even in the ensemble sense, uh, when the bulk dimension is uh, at least three. Um, so maybe Alex will disagree on it, and we, have can, we can have some uh, discussion on it. And uh, so finally, one option that uh, might be possible is to set up so, some sort of bootstrap program. And if you have uh, dual CFTs uh, that, sa that satisfy all the criteria to have some classical um, bulk duals, you can ask, uh, you can try to impose something like factorization and try to hope to discover that stringy degrees of freedom or some other degrees of freedom are necessary for factorization to, um, to work. Well, with that, let me thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorenz. So uh, one more time, we can directly ask Lorenz before opening it up more generally, or maybe that will happen anyway. Uh, this is a question about the Lorenzian picture. Sorry, pun unintended. Uh, in uh, case of uh, BTZ black hole, uh, I mean, uh, and uniquely for BTZ black hole, uh, because it's in lower dimensions, the black hole can be obtained uh, as a quotient of global ADS3. Uh, I was wondering if uh, there's a way in string theory to see the emergence of the thermophil double uh, uh, once one takes this uh, space-time orbifold. Well, the short answer is I don't know, uh, but I, see. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. At that. I see. Thanks. But it would be interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, great talk, uh, all the panelists. Could, could you clarify what you mean by the second point in, in light of what we just heard from Alex? So right. th that... Is that a con okay. in contradiction with what you're saying, or I, I would say it might, maybe in my contradiction. So Alex was proposing some uh, some um, three-dimensional. Well, he was considering pure three gravity, and it was dual to some ensemble of almost CFTs. So we don't know whether that ensemble of almost CFT is consistent in any sense. Uh, we don't understand the rules of them. We also don't understand the rules of pure gravity because, in principle, in pure gravity there are many more contributions than what Alex showed. We can have all sorts of crazy manifolds. We know that 3D manifolds, their, their, their classification is extremely hard. So trying to sum over all 3D manifolds is virtually impossible. And there might be some non-perturbative, like for even in JT gravity, we know that the partition function is some asymptotic series and we need to know about non-perturbative contributions at the end of the day, which even in JT gravity are hard to construct. So at the end of the day, uh, there's a question, how do you define this pure 3D gravity? And um, maybe in JT gravity, we have a good answer because we have a boundary, boundary ensemble that defines it. But in 3D gravity, we're missing both. We, we don't know what we need to do in 3D gravity. We don't know what we need to do in the boundary ensemble that is almost CFTs. And um, so perhaps there's some way to make sense of it. But so far, uh, I think we're not yet there.
Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you say that there's a distinction between theories that are hard to study and theories that don't exist? Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, a spin glass is hard to study. Uh, it's a chaotic system. Oh, sorry. As, like, so for, for example, a spin glass is hard to study. It's a chaotic system. Uh, and studying any individual representative of some ensemble of you know, spin systems with random couplings would be very difficult to determine the exact spectrum up to ep exponential accuracy. Uh, but it doesn't mean that those don't exist as quantum mechanical systems. So couldn't it equally well be the case that there are many theories that one could think of as representatives of an ensemble like the one that I wrote down, each of which could be thought of as representatives of a theory of pure gravity, and they're just very difficult to study, uh, but that doesn't mean that they don't necessarily exist. All right, let me respond to that. Um, so I think the main difference from, uh, say, 3D gravity and spin classes or other hard-to-study models is that we understand at least the rules, what we need to do in spin class. Whereas in 3D gravity, we have no idea what the rules are. And like, so, you, I mean, what you would need to do is to include all off-shell 3D manifolds, possibly with some singularities that we can discuss what you should include uh, and integrate over them in some way, which seems completely it's not only hopeless, it's also ill-defined, this problem, right? Because we don't know what we need to include, uh, what sort of contributions. And uh, so that's, I think, the difference between hard to study and uh, ill-defined in some sense. I agree that some parts are well-defined and we can do some computations, but this doesn't mean that it's a full theory of quantum gravity. Okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we would all agree that we don't exactly know the rules of the game when it comes to quantum <laughs> gravity. I mean, I think we can probably agree on that statement. Right. Maybe we can leave that here. <laughs> can, I, can I make a comment? Um, is it clear to you, even when you have a top-down situation, like say n equals to four super Yang mills, that the bulk theory on its own and its own independent formulation can really reproduce the spectrum of black hole microstates? Exactly. Because that's somehow what we're talking about here, right? To resolve yeah. factorization, you need to you know, determine the spectrum of black hole microstates. The question is not can it be done in practice, but really, really can it be done in principle? Right. Uh, I'm referring to the CFT. Yeah, I, I totally agree that string theory has some of the same problems that uh, what we just uh, said with Alex. So that was essentially my second slide, uh, or third slide. So there are these non perturbative contributions. In string perturbation theory, we more or less know what to do. And then there are some non perturbative contributions. And to some degree, we also know what to do. But then if you become more non-perturbative, at some point you have no idea what to do. And uh, we do know of some non-perturbative formulations of string theory, but they usually are basically the boundary CFTs of ADS-CFT correspondences. So you might very well be worried that we have the same problems in string theory, um, but there are much better candidates for the boundary CFTs in string theory that, than there are for something like pure gravity, And I think. But you um, agree the bootstrap has not ruled out a 2D CFT with a large central charge and no Virazoro primary operators up to dimension of order C. That I might exist, right? Totally agree. And if yeah. that exists, I think we not, call that. There may, there may be even not C, but C over nine or something. But yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then we could call that theory or any of those theory. If there's a family, they would all be candidates for pure gravity. Well, if you find literally one that has the exactly right gap for at least up to order one corrections, then I think you would call call that pure gravity. But um, but I think, I mean, there doesn't seem to be a universal one, whereas in other cases, there's always some kind of universality. So the only universality that we seem to have in 2D CFTs is basically the one that Alex seemed to describe. There's some statistical universality, but there is essentially Leoville. That is totally universal, but we do agree, everyone, I think, that Leoville is not a good 2D CFT that has a nice bulk dual. At least it's not what we would call 3D gravity. And then there doesn't seem to be other CFTs, natural ones, at large central charge. Um, and I think that's, even if we find some nice chaotic CFT at large central charge, then we could call that 3D gravity, but I don't think that we learn much of saying that. Um, well, first of all, over there, and then there was another one over here. Should I sit back down maybe? Otherwise I feel exposed. <laughs>
comment that slightly relates Lawrence's talk to Alex's talk. So Alex's open question is, should we average over N? Wouldn't you say the fact that um, we know that there are certain protected quantities like indices or degeneracies that uh, for which you know the bulk does factorize, wouldn't you say that that's enough to prove that you cannot average over N for those quantities? Yes, I agree. And I think there's other reasons why it's, it's a bit confusing to try to think about averaging over N because N is something simple in the CFT. It's a stress tensor three-point function. That's you know low energy data. So we think that is fixed. So that's part of what we don't want to average over, if, even if you do want to average somehow. So that plus the indices, I agree, uh, you know, makes it questionable of that, whether that's the right thing to do. Great, thanks. Just a question for uh, both Alex's. So the proposal was to link um, the lack of factorization in gravity to a small violation of the crossing equation. The question is whether there's any gravity calculation that shows a small violation of the crossing equation. Not that I know of. I don't know if you have more to say. I mean, gravity almost by definition, I think, would be crossing invariant. Um, so for example, the ensemble that I described was not crossing invariant and it wouldn't exactly match Einstein gravity. I mean, I drew some saddles where it works, but there are other saddles that won't get matched because I didn't implement all of the, all of the crossing conditions, such as the one that my, the, the, the representative of Switzerland um, mentioned in one of his, his papers with his collaborators. Isn't that, uh, well, isn't that one way to say that there can be no precise sense in which, uh, your proposal could work because if gravity, if pure gravity, let's say with uh, these defects or whatever, uh, exactly satisfies the crossing equation, then uh, there would have to be always some small errors in. Well, I mean, I would guess that pure gravity is dual to the maximum entropy probability distribution on the space of solutions of the of the conformal deep trap. Yeah. If if like if pure gravity exists, I think that's what it should be dual to. I'm also very open to the idea. I think it's probably even likely that um, you know this is a conference called strings, right? So I think it's probably likely uh, that other degrees of freedom, in addition to those of just uh, you know general relativity, are necessary in order to obtain a fully UV complete quantum theory. I think that's very likely. That doesn't mean it's not worth pushing as hard as possible uh, in order to try and construct a theory of pure gravity to see potentially uh, where it goes wrong. Um, and, I, I, and I think we're at the point where what we would really like to do, I mean, I think I'm going to agree with Lorenz here, is try and identify a fully off-shell uh, contribution from pure gravity. Um, as opposed, you know, so far, like the discussion that I gave and most discussions of pure gravity either involve uh, studying saddle points, solutions to the equations of motion, and perturbative corrections uh, uh, to these solutions. Something fully off-shell, a fully off-shell contribution uh, in the space of the integral coming, a fully off-shell contribution uh, coming from the integral over a space of metrics is, would be very interesting to understand. Um, but I, that's a, I mean, aside from JT gravity, I think there are very few, maybe, uh, I can think of a few, but I, I, I'm not allowed to give citations. But there are very few cases where, where, where this can really be understood. We had a question up here. One. It's more, more of a comment. Uh, th there was this paper by Benini and a collaborator where they discuss a uh, Chern Simons theory in the bulk, yeah. which uh, would have some global symmetries, but if you portion uh, these globals, you gauge these global symmetries, uh, then the theory reduces to a boundary theory completely. It's, it sounds like a nice toy model for how, how this could work. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if, if he's. I... Yeah, I saw him earlier. Up there, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the collaborator also yeah. agrees. <laughs> yeah, if I remember correctly, it involved the absence of global symmetries, yeah, of higher form global and symmetries and being related to the sum over geometries. Yeah, I agree. That seems like a great uh, model. You also well, have something. Yeah, one thing I would though say that in this model, I think it's quite interesting that there's actually no sum over geometry necessary. It's what, what instead happens, or Francesco can correct me if I'm wrong, but that a every bulk manifold gives the, the right answer on the spot. And also modular invariance or crossing sy symmetry, it just um, comes out 
but it's not obvious at all in the boss description. Um, yeah, so that's quite interesting. Um, so uh, there was already a question here and, and there, but um, I mean, if, if uh, Francesco wants to say a couple of words, uh, you're also. <laughs> now he has to. No, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, now now I put you on the spot, but okay, let's leave it there. Yeah. So he, first here. Little plus. Uh, this is a question for Alex about uh, 3D PO gravity. Uh, so uh, the partition function that you wrote down with Edward nearly 15 years ago already showed some undesirable features of 3D PO gravity, including uh, negative density of states and so on. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so is there any wiggle room left so that, uh, I mean, 3D PO gravity could still be made sense of or you can still make uh, some reasonable uh, conclusions uh, based on just 3D PO gravity? So the answer that we wrote down in 2007, sorry, I hope I'm, can you hear me? Uh, the answer that we wrote down in 2007 had several undesirable features. Um, it had a continuous density of states, I think, which at the time was viewed as a serious problem, and now uh, one might view as simply a signature of averaging. So in the same sense that random matrix theory has a, that a, a random matrix has a continuous density of states, uh, even though every individual n by n matrix would have a discrete spectrum. So so we might view that continuous density of states as simply a smearing over some exponentially dense um, set of microstates. The negativity is a more serious problem. And there was this paper of, of Oguri and, and Benjamin and collaborators. Um, uh, this is why we don't do citations because I can't actually <laughs> the full author list. Um, but there was that very nice paper that pointed out that there were additional negativities in the partition function, not just uh, in the scalar sector, but in the spin, spinful sector. Um, uh, these can be resolved in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way of resolving them is to add some matter below the black hole threshold. But you asked if there's some wiggle room, and there is another resolution which is literally wiggle room. Uh, which is that you, know, you, you, you have this sort of, uh, in, the energy, in the energy spin space, this is, the, this is the extremal black hole spectrum. You can add little wiggles. <laughs> Uh, and that actually cures the problem. And that was explained in a paper of, of Maxfield and, and Tiriachi. Um, so I think there is definitely room there. Um, and I think Eric um, Perlmutter might say other things about that during his talk later this week. Spoiler alert. Thanks. Um, I, I assume we're at the point where we're not just commenting on Lorenz's talk. Is that true? <laughs> Okay, um, I, I wanted to maybe say some like ETH related clarifications. Um, I guess the first thing is in response to Edward's question to Canadian Alex, um, which was about whether you would expect um, corrections that don't just go as like e to the minus s, but as for higher powers, like further suppressed powers. Um, so I guess, one way to derive the statement of the ETH that you need is to um, go to the microcanonical ensemble. So you've got energy windows with some width, and then assume that um, you're just taking some typical state in an energy window. Um, and in the limit that the energy windows, sorry, the Hilbert space of an energy window is infinitely large, then the central limit theorem just gives you the statement of ETH exactly. Uh, but if you backed off it being infinitely large and had it finitely large, then I guess I would expect higher corrections in general. So there would be things that went not just as e to the minus s, but as e to the minus 2s and so forth. Um, I guess the other statement, um, and this is coming from my memory of the paper with the UBC group, uh, I guess only Moshe is still at UBC. Uh, so I apologize if I don't remember the details exactly, but when we computed the Haar integral to get the two-point function, um, the, the correction that we wanted to identify with the wormholes um, was suppressed by a factor not e to the minus s, but it was one over one plus e to the s. 
And then we remarked that, okay, you could tailor expand that and think of that as there's a contribution that's either the minus S and either the minus 2S and either the minus 3S and so forth. So if you changed away from the Har ensemble to something slightly different, then that Taylor series would be a little different. So the correction might like slightly different. Um, I guess the, the other comment I had was about self-averaging. So I think, again, the, the statements about correlation functions don't really necessarily care about self-averaging. And certainly for black hole microstates, we know that there are some very interesting states that are not self-averaging, namely the things which look like take something that will collapse into a black hole and evolve it for a time period where it hasn't had time to settle down. And so like these are obviously black hole microstates, even the ones that's a collapsing cell that, where the horizon doesn't even exist. Um, and I think most of us would agree that we should consider these bona fide black hole microstates, but certainly there are things that have properties that look very unlike the average um, across the black hole microstates. Thanks. Just a comment about the last thing you said. Um, depends what you mean by black hole microstate. What you described is not an energy eigenstate. What you described is more like a coherent state peaked around a particular energy band. Sure. So it's a you know very detailed superposition done in exactly the right way look at, to look like collapsing matter. Yeah, okay. So, so it's just, far just, from a typical state and it's by design in some yeah. sense. So, to, to, Use the, to use the formalism that we, we did in the UBC paper, I would have to write, I would have to take the collapsing shell and I would have to like project it onto a particular energy window and I think you're probably correct that it, I would, shouldn't expect it to have much support on any fixed energy window. Thanks. I'll also um, make one comment about the relationship with ETH, which is that ETH, um, I think in a CFT you can regard as a statement about the asymptotic behavior of OPE coefficients. <laughs> it's usually stated as a statement about the asymptotic behavior of light, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients in a limit where two of the operators are becoming heavy and one is not. Um, this, the ensemble that I described really requires statements about heavy, 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 like all OPE coefficients, including heavy, heavy, heavy. So it's something like an extension of ETH, um, a very reasonable one, um, even in our original paper on the asymptotics of the OPE coefficients. We sort of conjectured maybe that one should extend ETH in that manner. Um, can, I, can I say one more thing? So you reminded me. Um, right, again, the version of ETH we're using is sort of non-dynamical. It doesn't really, it, it's a statement about the expectation value of eigenstates of one observable, um, the expectation value of some other observable in eigenstates of the first observable. And as long as there's no special relation between the first observable and the second observable, you, you can apply the central limit theorem. So we usually apply it for energy eigenstates and then say this has to do with thermalization, but the ETH is sort of a misnomer, like the T in it, it's really just a statement about eigenstate averaging. And so it would be nice to have something to say further dynamically, but I don't think you need it to do the whole course graining picture. I, I see that there are other points, but I wanted to allow myself to jump in for one thing because uh, actually to Alex Maloney also, and, and uh, comment to you, well not comment, question more. There was another, several times raised the fact that there is like uh, notions from, from quantum chaos, basically like ETH or random matrix rings. Um, I was just wanted to put the question to the panel or maybe other people want to comment as well. How, how important it is really whether this could work in an integrable theory as well to have, you know, wormhole-like theories or, you know, uh, dis discuss factorization. Is it really how essential is the connections to chaos? I mean, certainly, for example, all of your points are only valid in a theory that's actually chaotic. And I wanted to make one small question specifically to you, because you said that somehow you wanted chaotic theory because it will be self-averaging. In, in my understanding, it's not true, in fact, that there also are non-self-averaging objects in chaotic theories. I mean, just to... Yeah, I was, in, I was intentionally vague about, or I meant to be intentionally vague about exactly what I meant by self-averaging. But, but, but coming back to your earlier point, I mean, I would suspect that in an integrable theory, you wouldn't find wormholes unless you put them in by hand. Uh, so the example I gave of the averaging over Narain moduli space is a sense in which we're considering an ensemble of integral, uh, integrable theories, um, but we're introducing the ensemble, and that sort of generates the wormholes, but that they wouldn't, you know, if you were just looking at the coarse graining rather than the ensemble averaging, you wouldn't find anything that even effectively looks like a wormhole in that theory. That's my guess. But aren't there some models which claim that's, that that's the case? 
Okay, I would love to hear about that. Um, so I think both Alex's, they mentioned this example where we take some uh, four point function and uh, pick an OP channel and expand it as a sum of squares of a P coefficient and there's some averaging and that matches in some non-trivial topology. So now I would assume that we can also pick a different channel and uh, also perform a, an expansion there and it will map into some different set of geometries in the bulk. So now on the boundary, we do not sum over P channels, right? We pick one OP channel that reproduces the full answer. Doesn't it suggest, well, maybe closer to what Lawrence is saying that also in the bulk, uh, we will overcount if we sum over all possible topologies and maybe a more detailed question, is there any hope to see how, you know, the other, there are kinematic regions where I say both OP channels converge, right? Is there a hope to see that in the bulk, other topologies, you know, the other OP channel gets reproduced? as an expansion around the first channel? Yeah, I, I mean, almost by definition, the gravity path integral is the sum over channels. That goes back to the original black hole fairy tale, I, I, I think, where, you know, indeed, there are two different ways of thinking about the computation of any observable. That's either as a sum over a single channel um, of all of the states propagating in that channel, or as a sum over all channels, only of the light stuff propagating in those channels. Um, it would be incorrect to sum over all things propagating in one channel and to sum over channels, of course. So there was Eric up there. Uh, just to comment on um, this ensemble uh, dual to pure gravity in ADS3, it's a little misleading to say that the violation of crossing is exponentially small in the following sense. We don't yet know of a way to restore crossing, including modular invariance, and preserve the gap of pure gravity while avoiding violations of unitarity that are not small. Until your talk on Thursday. Uh, no. Um, I mean, it's, it's true that in particular regions of Teichmuller space, um, the violations of crossing symmetry are exponentially small, but there are other regions where they're not exponentially small, precisely because I, you know, we, we, we weren't, able, we didn't solve the entire conformal bootstrap problem. Um, we only imposed some of the constraints of crossing and not all of those. Roughly speaking, we imposed S invariance and not T invariance in the language of modular and symmetry. I mean, one can see that because I assumed a Cardi density of states. Uh, the, Cardi dens the Cardi density of states spin is not quantized. Okay. So it's S invariant, but not T invariant. Uh, of course, imposing both of them simultaneously is a very difficult task. I don't think it's in principle impossible, but it's very difficult. I don't know if that really answered your question, though. Yeah, no, I think we're on the same page. I, I just feel it's sort of an essential challenge of the construction of a consistent pure gravity partition function to reconcile all of these things. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I, so, I mean, you know, we have one wants to look at all regions um, you know, this is like saying you want to include all of the appropriate saddles. Yeah. I mean, one could certainly imagine instead of just using the Cardi density of states, writing down a full SL2Z invariant density of states. Okay, maybe it's got these tiny little negativities, but you add a little wiggles or you add some other matter to fix up those negativities. And then you replace the uh, average density of states that I wrote down that was S invariant by the thing that's fully SL2Z invariant. Um, great. Okay, do it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Doing that explicitly is a, is a big open I question, I, I think. I agree, I agree you completely. Know, that, that's part of what we should do. I mean, the, the Maxfield and Teriyachi proposal is lovely, um, but Mind not it, explicit yet. I don't, and know we should modular, make it I don't know of a modular yeah. completion of it that's been written down, but we can, yeah, let's do it. I mean, this is over, right, so I'll meet you at 25 <laughs> minutes, 24 minutes. But in, in some sense, this is a bit of a separate issue than the one of wormholes, right? It's something that you would want to solve just for like the torus partition function before moving on to more complicated things. So I guess like what you guys did is, um, you know, just asking about the Euclidean wormholes on the Euclidean section for now. And sure, at the end of the day, you want to put everything together. But I would say those are sort of separate problems. I don't know if you, if you agree. Not really. Yeah, it's clearly, you know, uh, a really nice and strong statement that 
this ensemble reproduces all of the uh, you know, gravitational saddles, saddle by saddle with any number of boundaries, just with this pretty minimal assumptions that are well motivated from identity block dominance in ways we understood before, but seem to buy you so much more saddle by saddle. So I, I, I really like that. Looking at the torus partition function, you know, sing single boundary and trying to nail that, not at the quantum level even, but just semi-classically. It's a separate problem, but in a way it's a simpler problem that, you know, <laughs> I feel we should, we should under, understand more fundamentally. Maybe I can also ask something similar about that uh, to Alex. Like, uh, don't you think that eventually it's also related to what Edward asked in the beginning? Uh, when you when you include higher moments and uh, that actually no moment of that uh, that statistical distribution will be will be well defined. It seems like in the end uh, everything once you include all the corrections that all the moments will eventually be infinity. So in some sense maybe one should can you clarify maybe in what exactly we're expanding? Um, I actually I would have guessed that maybe the nth moments of the OPE coefficients are finite up until n is equal to the central charge. Um, but maybe that's, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a, a better, I don't have a great answer to that question. I, I can comment on this. So, so we calculated this. So the, the higher moments of OPE coefficients are further exponentially suppressed in the following sense is that, you know, the Gaussian moment goes like e to the minus s times a number. And then the net weight of the non-Gaussianity on individual OPE coefficients goes like e to the minus s times another number that's bigger. So it's an, an, it's an expansion if you want an e to the minus s. And the same thing happens in ETH. So I think for any finite moment, and this is related to Edward's question also, for any finite moment you can fix it. The sort of more interesting question is, can you really fix it all the way, like sort of non-perturbatively? And yeah, maybe at moment of order c something goes wrong, for example. But, that, that's very. That's an interesting question. My, my, I mean, my intuition came from that because in many of the examples that I, I know to compute, including including in the Carl, related to the Carl gravity paper that you had, um, genus G partition functions computed in a gravitational path integral tend to diverge when the genus is of order the central charge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I would guess that maybe the small moments of the OP coefficients are fine, but large moments, once the moments of order C, something goes wrong. So, so you would say there's some some magic non perturbative effect in 3D gravity that we don't understand. That's doubly, trying case. Doubly non derivative. That's trying case. Sorry, the question was at some point it seems like the observable is going to be big enough if it's a high point correlator that one of your approximations is going to break down and maybe it's like a low, a no back reaction I, thing. I think that the actual probability distribution on the space of OPE coefficients has fat tails in the sense of a you know, probability theory. That's my guess. That, that's like a guess. Um, so, I, even a <laughs> so I, I had a comment and a question. Um, so for the comment, um, so I noticed in this panel the word averaging is being replaced a lot by the word coarse graining, which is good. I just wanted to mention that, you know, there is a whole theory of coarse graining in ADS-CFT that goes back to the papers of Engelhardt and Wall. Um, from uh, 2017 and so on, and uh, in terms of the outermost wedge and thinking about the complexity of reconstruction and uh, has recently sort of connected nicely to this idea of the Python's lunch. And yeah, I thought it would be interesting. I mean, it seems to me like there must be some connection between this way of thinking about coarse graining, which is kind of a Lorenzian way of thinking about coarse graining, where you've you know, fixed the simple observables and try to maximize the state and so on. Maybe someone said this, and I would, because I was in the other section earlier, I don't know. But yeah, I, but I haven't seen that connection yet. Maybe, maybe you, you have it, and I haven't seen it somewhere. So, so, so that was the comment. The question is, I feel like there's a bit of a mismatch in the way that we talk about JT gravity and the way we talk about 3D gravity. So I don't, today, see people saying, what's the dual to pure JT gravity, and then go around looking for some zero plus one dimensional quantum system. People have sort of accepted that JT gravity is not dual to some zero plus one dimensional quantum system. I mean, we could say, oh, it's, I don't know, it's you know something like SYK or something, but where there was a gap in the spectrum or something. I feel like actually that would be a pretty useless definition of pure JT gravity. 
you know, the whole point of JT gravity, and I would submit also of two plus one dimensional gravity is that it's normalizable. And so you should take it seriously by itself. If you say, oh, there's a gap up to some spectrum and then there's some more stuff that we don't understand, let's not call that pure gravity, right? I mean, then, then you're just giving up on the fact that gravity is renormalizable. I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for Edward, but I'm pretty sure when he talks about two plus one dimensional gravity as a solvable system, he means the renormalizable bulk Lagrangian, you know, without extra fields or strings or brains or, or something. And in JT, we all seem to think that way, but somehow in two plus one, people are still have this other attitude. So yeah, I'm curious what you would say, I mean, isn't it, I don't know, is it, why do we call it pure gravity or why do we look for it? I mean, then it's just not unique or anything, right? Maybe one comment is that when we say that it's renormalizable, what do we really mean by that and what we expect to be able to compute? I don't think that tells us what the rules for the sum over topology is. So it's true that you can compute arbitrary point correlation functions of stress tensor insertions and you're good to go. So that's one sense in which it's re renormalizable and you can also presumably cure the divergences in you know, partition functions on manifolds. But I don't think that tells you what the rule of the game is on whether you're supposed to sum over topologies in the bulk or not. Yeah, but you'd say the same about JT, right? Wouldn't you say exactly the same about JT? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think mean, I would, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, the two seem almost identical. You know, it, it just 3D, it's harder to do the calculations, but I see no conceptual difference. Exactly. Because it's, yeah, because it's easier to do the calculations, but conceptually, I don't see any difference. Me, to me, pure gravity in 3D is a theory that's defined by a sum over geometries. Uh, we don't know exactly how to do that sum. We know how to do it in some approximations. Um, if we knew how to do exactly, like, you know, the reason JT gravity is interesting, as Juan said, is that we know how to do the sum and we can do Yeah, it. But, but it seems like we're looking for an answer which is not analogous to the answer we found in JT. That's what's confusing yeah, yeah. to me. I don't know why you say that. If I can also comment. So in JT, there's one huge difference, I think, is that there is a coupling constant that suppresses higher topologies. So there's a well-defined ex topological expansion, which is not, not there in 3D gravity. So in 3D mm -hmm. gravity, it's much more murky. There's no natural topological. Sorry, what's wrong with the ADS scale and Planck units? doesn't naturally order topologies like in, in, in JT gravity there is S naught that mm. systematically suppresses higher genus. And then there are also non perturbative contributions, so which we also don't really understand from JT gravity perspective. We understand them more or less from the minimal string perspective. And you can say that JT gravity is some limit of the minimal string, but that's also something we have to put on uh, in on top of the usual just writing down the action of JT gravity doesn't tell you immediately that there should be these non perturbative corrections, I think. But do you imagine that there's a zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics which is dual to pure JT gravity? Is that a thing that we would ask for? Because it seems like people are asking for that for two plus one. And I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think one of the distinctions is that in quantum mechanics, you don't have a constraint like crossing symmetry. So if we want the dual theory, to be, you know, to obey the crossing of heavy operators in the case of a dual of 3D gravity, that's much more constraining than what you want to demand in the dual of JT gravity, which is quantum mechanics. So we might say that any, you know, every instantiation of the SSS ensemble is a kind of dual of JT gravity if you coarse grained it. But the instantiations of the ensembles in the discussion of 3D gravity don't obey the axioms of 2D CFT because they don't obey crossing of heavy operators. So the theory is, if there is one that did, would be a special, a very special theory, unlike, you know, all of the quantum mechanics is in the SSS ensemble are kind of equally good. There's no special one that satisfies some fine-grained constraint. I think that's kind of a big distinction. I think pure gravity, to the extent that we know how to define it, does satisfy the constraints of crossing symmetry and modular invariance. The problem is that we don't know exactly how to compute the sum over geometries uh, or the sum over topologies, uh, which is why we use all these different te techniques, like trying to confine CFTs dual to it. Sure, I mean, the gravity uh, monsters will obey crossing. Well, although you don't know how to compute the correlators of heavy operators yet. No, but we know how to but compute but things the, that encode know, that data. But, but that's a very hard constraint for the dual, unlike in the 3D gravity. So Juan wanted to uh, make a point, I think, but um, you do go ahead, but afterwards I think we have not gotten back to some of the 
questions in Olga's uh, presentation, for example. I wanted to ask you about analytic continuation, but maybe we'll first have Juan's comment. Just one comment that I think there is an interesting disconnect between the discussion in this section and the discussion in the other session, where they they think that well there is some there are some particular theories and there are some theories we're discussing here which they would say we should throw them out as inconsistent, and here we're saying these theories are very interesting because they are giving us averages over those consistent theories, and I think it's interesting and I would like to understand whether we should really take this seriously. For example, if we have a theory of gravity plus an axion, and then we consider wormholes and so on, are they giving us the typical size of instanton effects in some consistent theory? It sounds like a tall order to, for, for that to be true. But um, So perhaps one way to ask my question is whether, um, whether there are theories that are inconsistent even as averages. Examples are known. Good, 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 good question. question. Yeah. <laughs> I would more say ill-defined instead of inconsistent, because most things that we have are just uh, are just not defined in any way. Yeah, I don't think you can necessarily fix anything just by averaging. I mean, yeah. For example, you want to still, on average, have something like crossing, and so on. it's not clear that that always works just by averaging. But yeah, I mean, that's of course very, very important point. So yeah, so b because we have, I already said that I had a question about Olga's talk while she was giving it. So, um, but I also feel like that aspect has not been discussed at all. So analytic continuation, I think, is is, is, is an interesting idea. So I don't know whether you want to comment on what we can learn from that, or maybe just expand a little bit on your comment. So although we haven't worked out the analytic continuation per se, so. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, the point of my talk was uh, that, uh, in principle, you can have wormholes also in higher dimensions. So the examples that uh, most of we have discussed here are uh, in lower dimensions. And also, you don't only have pure mat uh, solutions to pure gravity. You can also have matter, and you need to find a way to explain those too. Um, so a possibility could be to have, like, a system of interacting uh, QFTs or CFTs that is unitary and uh, can give uh, uh, analogous uh, Swinger functional that corresponds to such a world for solutions. Now, uh, after you understand this, it's interesting to see what happens when we analytically continue because uh, from, the from the geometry uh, side point of view, if you analytically continue along uh, the radial direction, you can get the band grant uh, universes. So it would be interesting to see if uh, like if you can do the same analytic continuation from the QFT side and have a model for cosmology, uh, as well as, uh, okay, as I mentioned, if you uh, choose to analytically continue along the transverse directions, uh, then you can have a traversable wormhole, uh, wormhole, but then you should be careful. You might, uh, you might not be able to, to do this from the QFT side. Maybe your theory will not uh, satisfy the Osterwalder's rubber theorem. I don't know if you haven't thought, for example. So does this model that you have have explicit interactions then? So the interactions are uh, soft in the sense that they come by the fact that you have uh, an intermediate quasi-topological theory that connects the two boundary QFTs. And uh, essentially, this gives you a constraint. Like, for example, you can have, uh, again, a low-dimensional example is that you can have uh, two matrix quantum mechanics that they are the equivalent of what I said as big QFTs, that they are connected by a BF theory. And then uh, the um, boundary values of uh, the bulk gates field are the gates field of the gates matrix quantum mechanics. And when you integrate out the zero modes, essentially this leads to, uh, to the relation between uh, the representations uh, of the matrix quantum mechanic one with the matrix quantum mechanic two, and you need to sum over those. So essentially, uh, the fact that you have this intermediate theory induces this type of uh, interaction, which is very uh, soft and uh, it's not really just uh, putting a, a term by hand. I see, yeah, thanks. So maybe I can ask a question following up on that. Um, so the cosmological interpretation of these Euclidean wormhole solutions is very interesting. And I'm wondering, you know, should we be using the Euclidean, the, could we interpret the actions of these Euclidean wormhole solutions as computing the wave function of the universe in the sense of Hartle and Hawking uh, for, an ADS cosmology with a Big Bang singularity? I mean, is that, would you 
Yeah, I think this support should be that possible. Interpretation. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions, uh, maybe on that topic, or if uh, if someone has further so questions on so the what other. does that wave function look like? <laughs> I don't know. We haven't done <laughs> that mailing automation. We, I mean, uh, Mark Van Rassen works on this. Uh, mm -hmm. We have mostly worked on the Euclidean side. So okay. Thank you. Well, so um, I have been given some instructions. I feel like if we start asking more and more provocative questions, then these instructions will get uh, ignored. So I think I should say to everybody, okay, I should remind everybody because so we have some extra time to talk, but um, there are also some people who might not want to stay for that. So I just want to make sure that everyone gets these instructions. So um, um, for everybody, again, I'm, I'm supposed to repeat that the building closes at 8 p.m. Um, so when you leave this room, please uh, don't forget anything. Um, and uh, then more specifically for the speakers, so the speaker dinner, um, we meet for 6 p.m. to walk there. And um, if you continue discussing about this or any other topic, so you can still get the, the subway at 6.15 p.m. So we also meet at 6.15 p.m. Um, I think, didn't they say we meet like in front of the, the main building or, it, or maybe in the courtyard part of the main building? Yes? Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> there is an entrance. Th there's, <laughs> there's a wormhole. No, the yeah, there, the there's, a kind of a, there's a <laughs> kind of a traversable wormhole same, that goes from the courtyard to the main exit. So I think either on the courtyard side or on the main exit side of that. But I think you can even see people congregating. Uh, yeah, it. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know. That's maybe the most controversial question so far. I will. I will find out during the next five minutes. Um. So, yeah, I don't know what uh, may maybe the last sort of, well, should, should we actually, should we close it for people who want to leave and then we'll continue or uh, what, what do you think is the best option? I think maybe, maybe then this is the best option. So I think we should uh, thank all the panelists for their wonderful presentations. <laughs> and thanks everybody who contributed as well, of course. Thank you very much. So.